Have you ever seen a game die? I mean, literally, die, where one day it's playable, and the other, it's not. Well, aside from Star Citizen, and Dota 2 after a balance pass, you probably have never thought about a game death as such. As long as you can boot up a quote-unquote legally questionable cracked version you got off a Russian torrent site, it's all good, right? Even if no one is playing it, it's still playable, and thus, not dead. Well, sadly, in the ever-changing and evolving poo-stained entertainment genre of video games, there has been a certain trend that resemble evolution, but cancer. Games as service. Games where the publishers and developers hold the proverbial guillotine raised above the games' head, and it's only a matter of time before the game gets the casual French political treatment. Today is a sad day when we're gonna say goodbye to one such game, Lemnis Gate. And maybe, just maybe, we could make a positive change. So then, to start off our story, recently, <coughs> about two months ago, Lemnis Gate developers and publisher announced that the game servers will be shut down on June 11th and were removed from sales back in April 11th. So in that time I've been gathering information, <coughs> mostly waiting on responses from developers to make this story. But before we delve in, literally everyone out there is asking, what is Lemnis Gate? Is that some sort of a disease for my butthole? Now, if I were a cynical man, Okay, I mean, if I were a kinder Latvian horsehead, Lemnis Gate in a sentence would be a retirement home FPS. As the game's director puts it, My fingers are sausages and my brain don't work quick no more. So in PvP games, all the roided up kids on Smack and Sugar Rush constantly teabag me. So I made a game where I could still beat them. Developed by Canadian Ratloop Games and published by my, uh, favorite company, Frontier. Essentially, Lemnis Gate is a turn-based FPS game where you can interact with your and enemy past self-recordings to accomplish an objective. The idea is a time loop gameplay, but when you waterboard it down to bones, you basically take turns to smack each other upside the head while individual Twitch 360 non-scope proctology exam skills are not that useful, taking away the only useful skill young people seem to have in the society, being esports candidates for online skin betting sites to have something to bet on. Overall, the game is mediocre. As a simple shooter, it's fine. Mechanic are okay, and while the movement gets a bit annoying with collisions, it sure as fuck is hundred times better than what the publisher Frontier did with their own in-house game, Elite Odyssey. Visually, it's generic, but the good kind of generic. I smell Apex Legends in the character designs as well as Team Fortress 2. As a game overall, you know, I'll let the Latvian finance minister at the time describe it. Uh, I think you're nothing special. Uh... A decent hero shooter with nifty gimmick that I've only seen in puzzle games. Though, like the 70 year olds today on TikTok, being online fucked it up. Well, there is a simple tutorial with a simple AI match and a special offline mode where you can play both sides, a sort of playing against yourself. The game basically is a multiplayer only game. No single player career mode or story, it's just 1v1 or 2v2 matches. Now, if you've been around a crackhead corner at least once, you may recognize the same problem in similar games long past. Bring a wannabe TF2 clone with none of the charm, Lawbreakers and Dirty Bomb come to mind. All multiplayer exclusively focusing games with mediocre visuals, mediocre gameplay, even if polished, all relying on players to keep it alive. Well, the problem with these games sadly always comes crashing down quickly. Especially in the case of Planetside Arena! Woo! That's a deep cut! It's like a snowballing effect, but in reverse. The less players, the less games, leads to even less players and less games. Then no wonder when you wake up one day and the game that was still playable about a week ago is now deader than an American without a basic healthcare. This too happened to Lemnisgate, almost right at the start, and yet they kept on going for a year and a half. But eventually... From 11th April 2023, Lemnis Gate will be removed from sale on all platforms. However, we'll be keeping the multiplayer servers online, so you can all continue to enter the loop until 11th July 2023, at which point they will be closed. Console players will still be able to access the local multiplayer and training modes, however, PC players will be unable to play beyond that point. Hold on, PC players don't have local multiplayer? Hold on, you won't be able to even do the training on the offline mode either? 
That's right, this is when the game is not just unplayable, but outright killed. Because the game relies on servers to be running, I assume not only for matchmaking, but also for DRM on PC. Once the servers go, the whole game goes. Programming a new server is difficult enough, but companies will also encrypt their data in order to protect against hackers and piracy. This is known as digital rights management, or DRM. Well, that's reasonable while the product is still being sold, but once it's shut down, then this is the equivalent of locking things up and throwing away the key. This is where I decided to contact the publisher, Frontier, for comments on this, since they are taking over all the communications. However... <laughs> you see, I've had my share run-ins with the Frontier developments in the past. And let's just say I've not been the kindest to them. And even though they say I've not been blacklisted in the past, well, the fact is I tried contacting Frontier Developments first through email or Discord. All the people who are supposed to handle Lemnisgate and not a single one of them acknowledged even the fact that I sent them a message. So mm, that sets a precedent um, of... Um, you know, fill in the blanks yourselves. Uh, anyways, instead I did contact the developer, and to my surprise, either because they didn't know really who I was or what my standing with the Frontier Developments was, they managed to provide me with a few answers. And you know what? Good on those Canucks. Seriously, I appreciate it, so thank you. I asked a few things, and first and foremost, I do applaud Rattlu for choosing not to comment while still providing as in-depth answers as possible elsewhere. So then, if Lemnus Gate's servers are closed, uh, why can't you still play the rest of the game, like the offline mode or even the tutorial? Well, here comes the games as service. The current scenario can be basically summarized into this. Well, if the game is going to be killed, why not release the server code or final patch to allow players to make their own? You know, some sort of an end-of-life plan. Here, I do commend Ratloop for being very honest and admitting to putting all of their eggs into live service basket without the end-of-life plan. As for releasing code or making some sort of an update to allow players to continue running, Mr. Anderson admits that developers have been assigned to other projects and they do not have resources to spare at the time for something like this. I asked that developer who worked on a server emulator, how much work would it take for companies to provide the bare minimum to give users a reasonable chance to create a server emulator once the game shuts down? Well, he said there were two basic options. I'm not even gonna go over these, but you can see them here. Now this would not be enough for a playable game. This would be more like those repair notes, like it was mentioned in those European planned obsolescence laws. But okay, this doesn't seem like too much work, so I asked him how long would it take the developers to do this. He said it depended on how well the game was written and how competent the developers are, but anywhere from less than an hour to a few days. So at this point, all that's really left is to ask whose decision was it to close down the game? And predictably, in a word, Frontier. Yes, the publisher had the final say as to how the game is being handled and whether or not it even lived. Well, believe you me, I harbor no positive feelings for Frontier, as you might have noticed with my run-ins. However, Ratloop mentions that Frontier did a decent, if not a good job, for the game as a publisher, and the fact that they didn't cut their losses after the first few months, <coughs> like Planetside Arena, is probably thanks to the Frontier, and I respect that. Let's quickly talk about games as servers. If nothing else, I highly recommend you listen to Ross's Scott's wonderful essay on games as servers being fraud. I'll link it down below. If you only have to pay once and it's not a subscription fee for your game, then by definition, it's being sold under a perpetual license. Under most countries' laws, that means it's a good and not a service. A seller retains no decision-making authority over a product once they have sold it to someone else. The short version, you put down the money for a game that otherwise would be a disc in olden days and have the code, or at the very least if you got it digitally, you got the license. However, despite having your customer slash consumer rights, the company can still decide to intentionally brick your purchase in retrospect. If I sold you a copy of a game on disc, the next month while you were sleeping I snuck into your house and broke the disc, I would go to jail. In practical terms, that's almost exactly what Games as a Service is. If somebody sells you a bike and then later you get a flat tire, 
Yes, your product no longer works and it takes some effort to repair it. But that's something the average person can be reasonably expected to do. Or hey, take it to a repair shop. More importantly, the company that sold you the bike didn't come to your house and puncture the tire. I see that as an important distinction. And second of all, again learning from great Ross Scott, game archival is very important. Now some of you may know that I'm a huge advocate against killing games. By killing games, I mean the practice of a company's actions leaving a game completely unplayable by anyone who bought it. This is also known as bricking a game. Well, killing games and games as a service are handcuffed together. You almost don't have one without the other. I genuinely believe we have to preserve the creative, collaborative works at all costs. And though, yeah, you can set fire on most of the itch.io and piss on the ashes and no one will bat an eye, but games with genuine serious effort, unique and interesting design should be saved. Now this list may not be 100% accurate, it can be difficult to verify some information, but I'm guessing it's at least 95% accurate. And it's probably the most extensive data collected on this topic to date. So, out of 122 titles, how many times did the companies do something to either A, give customers a chance to run their game after shutdown, or B, give a full refund, no strings attached? Well, from my best count, here it is. Yeah, that's five titles. Or in other words, about 4% of all games as a service. So, that cool experience or unique game design, models, maps, hilarious voice acting or truly inspired genius will be lost. And all because a company doesn't want you to have it. That's right, a company either willingly, unknowingly or maybe apathetically will flip a switch to erase the memory and legacy that you and the developers made over the course of the game's lifetime. A phenomenally great example of preserving a game I love to point is Planetside 1, or the Planetside Forever T, which took a subscription-based game, which actually counts as a service, and re-engineered it to still be playable, while Sony at the time and Daybreak who took over the Planetside IP later, who didn't really help, but also didn't cease and desist the project either. Unlike what Activision did to SM2 recently, or literally anything that Nintendo does. But you see, that re-engineering was possible thanks to the tech gurus with incredible knowledge. But this kind of thing gets harder and harder to do when the companies encrypt files more and more. While at the same time, for developers and publishers, this sort of a task to allow the game to continue living is, in comparison, completely trivial. Fact is, most of these companies using live service games, they don't really care about the game preservation, pop culture or future generations, and you can't blame it all on corporate evil or intentions. It's mostly apathy. And as we've learned from World War II, well, apathy is where the real evil lies. Because there are so many games out there, you may think that it's okay that we don't save everything, and well, we can't save everything, it's not feasible. However, the reality is a lot more dire. Think about how many games right now that you're playing will stop existing, and I mean genuinely bricked, as soon as the login servers are gone. Take the garbage Redfall I reviewed recently as an example. It's by all accounts a solo game with maybe some co-op gameplay thrown in. But as I showed in my review, once you lose even the connection to internet, the game automatically stops working. Bethesda and Arcane have thrown in so much DRM and live service crap that even single player games now are treated this way. And the company may tell you, oh, it's to battle piracy, or the more bullshit, oh, it's to provide you with the best experience and to support the game going forward, and you definitely want it to be supported, right? I smell bullshit! Think, you want to boot up Redfall in 10 years time and experience and learn from its mistakes or just simply laugh at the crap that it has. But you can't, you can't because the login servers are abandoned. So tell me, is it fair to us that on a whim of a company, you can lose that game? Now back to Lemon's Gate then. Well, if there is no end of life plan to make it playable, I asked Ratloop Games about refunds. Well, sadly, it's not their decision, since Frontier is in charge of the game. However, then Mr. Anderson goes in to compare gameplay hours to some sort of weird implicated justification for killing a game? Now, I'm sorry about this. Though this is a very common simplification people make, one could call it even idiotic generalization and trivialization. 
Today we are talking about literally the makers of the product coming in and deliberately breaking it. Not whether or not spending certain hours equates to a value, which is also an absurd way of looking at things, but that's beside the point. Now, if you need a comparison, Mr. Anderson, you mentioned movie theater. Well, that is a service. The room, the audio, the screen, that's what you're paying for the most. See, games are like that Blu-ray disc you buy from a discount garbage bin in a gas station. And games like Lemnisgate getting killed is more akin to a movie studio coming in your house and breaking that movie disc. And yes, I get it, it's a generalization as well, but that's a lot closer comparison, don't you think? So, well, what's then left? Well, I suppose piracy is the last great bastion of game preservation. However, the only thing that it will preserve is the game files, not its playability. So, unless, like with Planside 1, someone comes along and reverse engineers it, the game is still bricked. However, there is a way we can all still win. But it is reliant on frontier developments, it seems, almost purely. See, in the past decade, frontier developments went from work for hire making this to literally rejuvenating space sim genre with Elite Dangerous along with Star Citizen. That success propelled them to finally become fully independent, making Planet Coaster and continuing to rise, eventually trying their hand into publishing. It's a success story that's inspiring. The first two games they announced and published were Struggling, which is a weird experimental small game and on Steam charts it's doing, well, as, as much as you would expect it to do. I still find it quite charming and unique. And can you guess the other one? That's right, it was Lemnisgate. Two weird, unusual experiences. It was a gamble and frankly I respect the hell out of that. So then, if killing Lemnisgate was Frontier's decision, that doesn't really reflect well on them. What's more, Frontier developments themselves have a few live service games on list. Though he dangerous, most of all, even had an end of life promise. So, how confidence inspiring do you think it is that Frontier shuts down a live service game, killing it instead of preserving it? Will this happen to Elite Dangerous 2, despite the promise? And what will happen to the rest of their games? Or games they're publishing? Now, I sympathize. Lemnisgate server upkeep is a cost that you can't simply keep eating up, and Frontier did run the servers for far longer than they really needed to, and that's a good guy move for sure. If we take an example of how reality works. But, does it have to be the end? Likely dangerous promise, Frontier, I implore you, together with Ratloop, who had nothing but positive things to say about you as a publisher, to release one final last update for Lemnisgate. Make it playable offline, or remove DRM, or maybe even release the server code. As a final farewell to the game, do something genuinely inspiring. This unique idea deserves to be archived. Ratloop artists, coders, designers, sound engineers, and even their pets deserve a better fate and frontier. Ratloop Games, you both have the capability to make the sad news into a great win for everyone. Frontier, you'll show that as a publisher, not only can you be trusted, but will go a step beyond to project a unique and different spirit from others. A positive change in the industry, while also ensuring your elite fanbase that the end of the game does not mean the death of it. Building trust and confidence that as a publisher and developer, you do your best, take an extra step to be fair to everyone, your customers, developers, artists and business partners, ensuring their legacy will go on, and you were there to make that difference. For players, it'll mean that they will get to experience what Ratloop developers had created, and I tell you, though, yeah, it's a small, little, mediocre game, it has a unique gimmick that's more than worthy to be saved and examined. Let not their three years of work from this small team go to waste. It is the right thing to do. In the games industry, we far too often see games disappear, no matter if they are good or bad. Games with genuine effort must be saved, and I ask you, the viewer too. Contact Frontier, share the video, ask them to be the good guy in the sea of bad actors, to show that there is a proper way of respecting games and their legacy, to do the right thing, to make a positive change that they are fully capable of doing. We all win if games like Lemnisgate are given a chance not to be bricked. 
be it the server code or its installations made public, removed DRM so that at least the offline mode is playable, or the whole stinking LAN play be added. So long as the game functions when the servers are shut, it's at least some kind of a win. And you know, also let Ratloop know that they made something interesting and we need more of it. Even if it may flop, it's still important as legacy. <sighs> okay, come on Frontier. Putting my asshole being aside, would you be the good guy today? I'll do a follow-up on this story if we get positive news and I sincerely want this to be the case. As I said, everyone wins. So for now, thank you for watching. Remember that games as a service is a fraud and check of course Ross's video, I'll link it down below. And more than ever, cherish the games that inspired you, cherish the work you do, save it, as you may never know who might get inspired by it down the line. As always, I thank all who support my work on Patreon and YouTube members and more, so check the links down below if you want to join the little generous bunch as well, it really, really does help. And more than anything, even if live service is fraud, we at least can do the right thing once it's time to retire these games. So fight for the legacy and do the right thing. If we save a small game like this, we can save the bigger ones too. And we must.